Hey, this is Rob Unspock with episode number 76 of the E-Heroes podcast. You see, I, I just mixed it up a little bit. Usually I don't even, uh, you know, say what the episode number is, but today I did. So we got a special guest. His name is Paul Ross. And today we're going to talk about the power of persuasion. And, and Paul brought his guest. That now people on audio can't see it, but he's got his, his uh, fur baby, his cat there. Uh, very, very nice looking cat. But you know, welcome, Paul, and, and thanks for being here. Thank you. And before I begin this exploration together, the world of subconscious language and its power to move lives, I just want to say, I don't know at which points your audience may stop and think to themselves, wow, this is really great stuff. Maybe I want to listen to it a second time. But as it's taking place, I want to say that I'm honored to be someone who can address your audience today in exactly that right way. Well, thanks. You know, and, and, and as we're recording this, you know, the, the society, the media is going crazy over the, the coronavirus. Right. And, and, you know, and not to say that's good or bad or, or what your, your, your feelings are on the, the subject. Uh, you know, I think people who follow me know my personal opinion, and, and I think it's overblown. Because. But the media does have, and they know how to manipulate that power of persuasion. I think that's true, and I think the soil for those poisonous seeds has been sown by an education system that doesn't teach critical thinking, that teaches that the number one virtue of the human mind is to just accept what authority says. Don't get out of line, or you're a weirdo, or you're a subversive, or you're a deviant. Whereas I think, wow, wait a minute. It's the very ways of thinking, acting, and responding that stands so far outside of what you're used to doing, the hold the potential of bringing you results that are so far outside of what you're used to celebrating and claiming for yourself. So right away, I'm taking the message and I'm reframing it using language, using a truism. One of the things I teach when you go to persuade people is to use universal experiences to shift the direction of their thinking. Imagine a flow of a person's mind that you want to experience. Imagine their flow of thoughts to be like the flow of a river. And if it's going in the wrong direction, it's going to flood. We want to redirect that river. So for example, in my book, Subtle Words That Sell, I talk about how to overcome objections. A common objection, I'm going to show you how we overcome it by using a universal experience. A common objection is I need more time to think it over. I would respond with a counterexample. I'd say, have you ever taken a long time to think something over and it still turned out to be the wrong thing to do? Now you're laughing and immediately I would suppose everyone in the audience listening to this is laughing because that's a universal experience. So when we use a universal experience that's contrary to the one they're bringing up, it puts a temporary gap in the consciousness of the listener and creates a window of suggestibility. So my algorithm is, first of all, what's my state of mind? Am I in a state of mind where I'm not hungry for the sale, where I'm present, where I'm of service, I'm ready to take action? And then I'm thinking, if they continue in this direction with their flow of thinking, what state of mind is that gonna bring them to? Is it gonna bring them to a state of mind where they're more likely to purchase or less likely to purchase? So my focus, Rob, is not first, on what your pitch is. My focus is no, no, no. What state of mind do you want them to be in when you deliver the pitch? You can have the most carefully crafted, beautiful pitch, but if they're in the state of being checked out because they're focused on their cell phone and have no attention span, the attention span of a goldfish, or they're confused because they have too many choices, or they don't believe they should invest in themselves, you're gonna have a problem. So first and foremost, I have a completely Bat, I don't want to curse on your show. A bat, <laughs> Go ahead. a batshit crazy different way of looking at things. Remember what I said? It's the ways of thinking and looking that are so different. My way of thinking is first think of what states of consciousness do you want your message to receive through? So this is the number one lesson. The second lesson I would say is you're never selling the product or service. You're always selling decisions and good feelings about decisions. So again, decisions and good feelings about decisions are state-based. They're based on the state you're in. 
if you're in a state of fear, you're going to make that decision to buy that bottle of hand sanitizer for 50 bucks. Correct? That's right. I don't need to do much of a pitch to sell you that hand sanitizer for $30 because you're making the decision in the consciousness of fear. So this whole idea of selling being about first and foremost shaping consciousness is completely revolutionary and off the wall and batshit crazy. But again, it's the very ways of thinking and acting and perceiving that are so different that bear the possibility of bringing you results that are so radically different. Uh, you had touched on, uh, you know, hungry for the sale. And I, and I know a lot of entrepreneurs that are so hungry for that sale that they will lower their price, they will lower their guard, they will get beat up. Yep. And uh, I've learned a long time ago, never be hungry for a sale because it, it, it allows that customer to just pommel you until they feel good that they've gotten, you know, the, the, the greatest deal that they could out of you. Now, you know what? Back up, you know, don't be hungry. Let the client know that you're not hungry and, and always be prepared to walk away. This is good advice for dating too. I started as a dating coach. Well, it's true. I started as a dating coach and I learned early on in my dating career, if I was hungry and desperate for that date, I didn't get it or it got canceled. If I was nonchalant and I was interested but not invested. The key distinction I would say is be interested in the sale but be invested in your skills. Mm -hmm. Champions are interested in every sale and committed to every sale but they're invested in their skills. People who are not rising to the top, no matter how good their degree of training, their mindset shift is still off. They have to make that mind shift, excuse me, mind shift. <laughs> that mind shift from, I, I caught it, they have to make that mind shift, I haven't had my coffee yet, between being invested in the sale to being invested in skills. I'll give you a metaphor, because again, I like to teach you metaphors. In a breakfast of bacon and eggs, the pig is invested. The chicken is interested. <laughs> oh, now I'm hungry. <laughs> you didn't expect this to be this uh, great an interview, did you? I'm like, no, that's, that's good stuff. You know, but how did you transition from being a dating coach to a business coach? Because fundamentally, it's about the power of language. And I learned early on that language structures consciousness, shapes decisions, drives behavior. If that's true for dating, it's true for selling. And essentially when you're dating, when you're selling, it's courtship. You've got to get the interest of that customer. You've got to get their, you've got to get them talking about themselves. You've got to overcome objections and forgive me, you got to close the deal. So it's really very, very, very similar. And early on, background, I began to see the correlation and the relationship and my initial training was in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. I thought, you know, there's no NLP model for dating. There's an NLP model for hypnosis. There's an NLP model for personal change. Let's come up with one for dating. So I was the first one in the Neuro Linguistic Programming community to do that. And along the way, I thought, hey, wait, I can use this for selling. And then I started to get, when email came into vogue, like, mm -hmm. In the 90s, first we had yeah. AOL, Instant Messenger, et cetera. Right. Started to get email from students saying, hey, listen, I found my wife using your stuff. I've got a family. I don't need any more advice on, <laughs> on succeeding with women, but I want to let you know I've been using this for my business and I've tripled my sales. I thought, oh, okay. And I started in 2006. I did a seminar on it. and I've been working on these ideas for 11, 12 years. I wrote my book, Subtle Words That Sell, my latest version. I did a revised version last year. And so that's how I got into it. Yeah, and it's I, very similar. You're, you're, again, you're structuring consciousness, shaping decisions, driving behavior. And you're always thinking, what state of consciousness is that prospect in? Which states do I want to move them through? What part of their mind are they receiving my message through? You know, in, in uh, my last book, Rob versus the Morons, I took on the, the idiotic <laughs> customer that service that's out there, and I, you know, and and, and Rob, I always Rob versus the Morons. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you a copy. Please. Uh, I have a. I I I started the series uh, last year with Rob versus the Scammers when I take on the Visa and Mastercard people that come to try to scam you all the time. That's why I followed it up with Rob versus the Morons, where I I take the transcripts of of conversations I've had with 
customer service. And, you know, the customer's not always right. No. But it, it's, it's the policies that these companies have that patronize you to the point where you're like, you know what, I'm just going to slap you upside the head and start over. You know, it, it's, I, I, I think entrepreneurs need to have, they, they need to grow a set of balls again and, and let people know that, you know, this is how they do business. But I think we've gotten too afraid. We've gotten too PC and, and, it's also part of the frame I set, and I mean this frame. So if I do coaching with people, whether it's uh, – I will do one-on-one -on -one coaching, but it's very – that's my premium thing. It's not what mm -hmm. I offer. I also will come in and train businesses and train teams. I mean this. I will do like an hour interview with people, and I really want to see if they're a fit because I've reached the point in my career where I don't have to work with everybody. Right. And I'm not mean about it. I'll say, let me propose an agenda for this call. And the agenda is, I want to find out more about you, what your goals are, what your strengths are, where you think you need to improve. I'll suggest some ideas and then we'll see if we make a good fit to work together. Does that sound good? And I really am, as I'm listening to them, I'm listening for their attitude. Am I going to have to wrestle them to the ground? Are they really willing to take the risk? Will they follow through, et cetera, et cetera. So if you take, the irony I found out in my dating coaching is, the more selective you are, the more selections you get. Mm -hmm. So write that down. I'm going to use that. I have a seminar coming up. <laughs> the more selective a salesperson is, the more selection they wind up getting. It's everybody, everybody needs to be writing that down. It's a paradox. The more selective a salesperson is, the more selections they wind up having. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and the funny thing is, is that I never thought about, you know, everybody says you got to have these avatars. You got to, you got to think about what you want. And, you know, and, and early on in my career, I was like, yeah, you know what? I, I, I just need everybody who breathes to give me money. Well, they all tend to be a pain in the ass because they're always looking for the cheapest price. They want the fastest service. They want this, they want that. They're so demanding. But once you understand that selection process, you know, it's going to open up a whole that's true. You know, window of the opportunities for you. And Rob, what I would say parenthetically to that, I agree with you. And hand in hand, side by side with that, on the other side of that bridge is, again, getting them out of that entitled, arrogant state of mind. How quickly can I move them from that into mm -hmm. a neutral state? Because I don't want to move them from that state into a positive, yes, I have to buy state right away. That's not possible. How do I move them to a neutral state? where they're open-minded, they haven't bought in yet, but they're no longer being arrogant. How do I precede the conversation? So right from the beginning, they're in a state of being at least open-minded and tuned in. I'm starting to develop a training with a plaintiff trial attorney for attorneys on how to use this to win a trial, only, only specific niche, which is plaintiff attorneys who are representing clients in, mm -hmm. in injury cases, malpractice, that sort of thing. Well, most of my clients are, are injury attorneys and, and, and uh, you know, you know, early on. And, and one of the things that I, I teach them is, is that, you know, it just seems like a lot of these attorneys have all gone to the Vulcan school of no emotion. No, and, no, no. Uh, you know, and I, I said, you got to open up. You got to be human. You got to be relatable and reachable and, and approachable. And, and you got to be, you know, you got to act as their friend and confidant. And, and a lot well, of them don't know how to. Well, one of the things I say, and if you're a trial attorney listening to this, uh, I, I will invite you to get in touch with me later. I'll tell you how to do that. But here's the thing. One of the things I, I, I'm going to be teaching trial attorneys is your number one problem with your jurors is not just getting them to believe you or skepticism. It's that they have no attention span. They're checked out. They're checked out. I've served on juries way before the days of the Internet. This is 30 years ago. And even then, it's easy to get overwhelmed and checked out. How do you get people checked in and totally focused on you, particularly if there's a lot of technical details in the case? So one of the things I'm, I'm going to be teaching is how to use subconscious languaging to create states of intense focus when you're speaking and then set an anchor so that when the other side's sinking, speaking, their minds just wander off. You don't have to get them even skeptical of the other side. That's good. Just get them to check out and wander off. Take advantage. And hypnosis, we say, if people are going to do a behavior and you know they're going to do the behavior, you incorporate it. You take that behavior and you incorporate it 
into what you want them to do. You take that river, that flow of thought, and you turn it in the direction. So instead of flooding, it irrigates your crops and your fields. How, how in the world did you come to it so most of your clients were trial attorneys? You know, I started out uh, as a, I had a carpet cleaning business for 20 years. Joe Polish. Yeah, I, I know Joe, and, and I, I, that was one okay. of the very first uh, marketing uh, programs that I went to in 1998. And, I got uh, you started. I yeah. got you started as a marketer. And, and uh, I met uh, Joe's brother, Tony, and, uh, you know, Tony and I, uh, you know, we would call each other constantly once a week, and I, I started learning marketing like, like a sponge. I mean, I would just soak it all in. Yeah. And uh, ironically, uh, two years ago, I helped Tony bring out his copywriting book, and uh, you know it was it was the, a great honor of mine because I was able to, you know, repay the the the, the mentor and the student. I became the mentor; he became the student. So it was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I I, I uh, halfway through my my carpet cleaning uh, career, I started writing ads for other carpet cleaners and and articles and. A lawyer had uh, found me and he says, you know, I, I, I need help. I said, okay. And from that, he started referring me to everybody. And then I started switching a lot of what we do and focusing on more of doctors and, and, and lawyers instead of the cleaners. Well, we should have a talk after this and see how we can. <laughs> I'm serious. See how we can. And then uh, over the last seven years, I've written, uh, I've, I've authored, co-authored, or produced 25 books. And, and uh, so it just... Uh, it all springboards from something. I agree. You know, just a quick story. Joe Polish, I met him. He heard me on a radio show when I was talking about dating. He, I said, fly me out to Phoenix. He has a say <laughs> about him. He had one truck. He was cleaning carpets himself. I said, mm -hmm. I brought him a copy of the Gary Halbert newsletter. Oh, yeah. I said, read this. You're not a carpet cleaner. You're a marketer. And that got him started. Yeah. And you know, I, I went to a seminar in I think in '98 and then again in 2000, and and uh, but but Joe has just done phenomenal yeah, things. He's phenomenal, he's a workaholic too. But yeah. never mind him. Let's get back to my. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the, the first time I ever heard of of the term uh, NLP was you know Tony Robbins back in back right. in the '90s, and I think he you know everybody just read his books and and figured he he coined it and. But it's been a lot. It's been around for a lot longer than he has. The I would say the mid '70s is when it yeah. first emerged as a partnership between Richard Bandler, who's uh, was teaching course, who is holding Gestalt therapy groups, and then John Grinder, who is a professor of linguistics at UC Santa Cruz, and they joined up with a couple other people, and they came up with these this model to ferret out patterns of excellence, to look at if someone's doing something with excellence, how are they using their language? What are their belief systems? What are they doing with their physiology? And they began to extract patterns of excellence from psychotherapists who were getting really great results. And the number one person I think they got was Milton H. I don't want to get too into NLP, but the number <laughs> one person they got was Milton H. Erickson who was to hypnosis, in my opinion, what Einstein was to physics. He took it away from the look into my eyes and made it mm -hmm. a completely different field. And so I think a lot of NLP is due to the work of Erickson. I consider Milton Erickson to be the grandfather of what I do. How to use language to structure consciousness, create those states of consciousness, create that filter through which your customer is going to view you before you even, if your attorney presented your case, if you're selling carpet cleaning by the way i wrote an ad i don't think joe ever used it it had a picture of a bed bug or magnified a million times oh yeah, yeah. and the headline was what else is lurking in your carpet yeah i think i think he did i think it because i you know i remember seeing that yeah i wrote that yeah but you know the, the one of the videos i was watching of yours and, and, and it, ironic i do the same thing is is that you know, when I go to conventions or conferences, I don't take notes anymore. I, I, I listen intently to the speaker. And, and one, of your, one of your speeches is all about not taking notes. And, and it was like, yeah, I'm looking around and looking at all the people taking notes, but they're not paying attention. Well, taking notes leads to, often, not always, leads to what I call educational bulimia. Everyone listening here has had the experience of taking a cramming for a test in high school or college you throw it up on the paper maybe you get your a but six months later 
you couldn't pass that test or tell me what's in it, or certainly not five years later or 10 years later. Whereas if you experience learning with me, you'll find yourself in a state of mind where you get the comprehension, you get the conceptual idea, and you also get some unconscious learning. Now, taking notes at the right time during the workshop period where you're breaking up into groups and doing things, that's necessary. And there'll be times when you learn with me where I will tell you to take notes. But generally speaking, I think it, it leads to the illusion or buys into the illusion that memorization is the mother of skill, which I think is not true. Yeah, and, and a lot of times you, yeah, you take these notes and then you don't remember the concept or behind those notes and or the meaning and, and it just, I don't know, I, I find if I, if I pay attention to the person speaking, I get more out of it anyway. True that. You know, so it, it just, uh, I, you know, you've been around the block for a long time, you know. Uh, not that old. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I turned 51 this year, so for me, I, I, I've, I've been around. I'm 61. You're a young man. Yeah, I, I've been around the block too. So it's, it's, uh, but you know, my, my whole goal is, is on these audio programs is to bring people that I think have exceptional superpowers and, and, and share them out with the audience. Green Lantern. And um, so for people who, who aren't watching this video, Paul has a Green Lantern ring, which to me is, is awesome because I, I like comic books. And, and uh, so do I. I have art all over the house. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's, uh, you know, everybody is different. Everybody needs to go out there and start sharing what they know to others, because that's what helps boost their authority in the world. I think we need to be able to construct a story that captures and leads per, a person's imagination, but then takes them through the chain of states that you want them in. Mm -hmm. If you tell a story just to be entertaining, that's great, you're an entertainer. However, to be a persuader, you have to not just entertain, you have to entrain. Listen to that. So you have to entertain, but you have to entrain. So what do I mean by entrain? By entrain, it's a hypnotic term. It means to increase the person's focus of attention on you and to narrow it away from other things and to create progressively stronger states of suggestibility so they buy more and more into what you're, you're saying. Now, is this manipulation? This is the big question I get. Yes, but is manipulation always bad? Well, maybe you've been manipulated into getting the wrong definition. One of the dictionary definitions is to move with skill and deliberateness. Mm -hmm. The other definition of manipulation is involving one of the following things, or more of the following things. Misleading about facts, saying that the car gets 25 miles per gallon when it gets five. Concealing material facts, not telling people that the drop, that the tank in the car is going to explode and catch fire. Using coercion, fear, that sort of thing, or force. I'm not talking about any of those things. To me, positive manipulation is simply shifting people into more useful states. If someone comes, again, whether it's a jury or someone who's on a podcast, whatever it is, if they're coming to you in a state of utter distraction or a state of being distraught, it's your job to move them into a state of, that's neutral and focused and then becomes progressively more enthusiastic. And most importantly, to control your state. Can you be in a state where you're knocked off your pins? Let's say you're in a trial as an attorney and something happens and you're knocked off your pins. Can you immediately get back into a neutral state? How do you do that? Well, I've taught guys who've been brutally rejected by women how to do that. How to go from being crushed by fear to in a second get back to being neutral. Notice I'm not saying super confident. The jump from being feeling smashed to super confident is too big a leap. The neurology won't hold it. You have to put the car in neutral. You know, and, and uh, I've been to a lot of, of conferences where I think some, some speakers like to use NLP to try to sell more product. The They're problem is towards the end of the day, it becomes a pitch fest where you've gotten six or seven people trying to sell stuff. And they're not using do. they're not using it very subtly that's why yeah. the name of my book is subtle <laughs> not obvious words that sell and, and 
and I will tell you, I've had some mentors who do a little song and dance and they say, that's NLP. And I'm thinking, yeah. how do I keep them as my mentor without offending <laughs> them by telling them they're full of shit and what they're doing? <laughs> Most of what you see, and, and I teach what I call street fight NLP. That's my own registered trademark. To me, most NLP is designed to work in the seminar room because people are self-selecting. They're paying lots of money. They've read about the subject. They're traveling. They're taking time. And they're raising their hands and saying, yes, do it on me. I want it to work on me. Whereas in the real world, people are not raising their hands. They're busy with other stuff. Yeah, and, and I think it's harder to, to break through that distraction because you know they're, they're on the Internet. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're texting. They're not really paying attention. Oh. So there's a way to do that. And that's what I, uh, I'm going to share one more thing. And that I know you're busy. And I really have loved this interview. I hope we get to talk again. I, I would say I want to create those states of focus right away. So I use what I call implied relationship words. If you go back and listen to this interview, I did it at the very beginning. I didn't say, well, I'm happy to be speaking with you today. I said, before we begin this exploration together today and I share what it is you'll be able to use. So I use the words we together and share. I made it about an exploration. These all imply a relationship with the listener. Now consciously you didn't get it, but unconsciously it created that state of, oh, we're sharing something together. We're in this together. That will immediately set aside skepticism and when you're sharing an exploration together, you tend to be focused, not distracted. So it creates a state of focus, relaxed anticipation, and trust, all in this, by using just a few words. That's the power of what I teach. And I invite the listener, go back and listen to what I said at the very beginning of this, even slow it down and write it out, and you'll see that's exactly what I did. And you didn't detect it, did you? <laughs> I didn't detect it. <laughs> no, one, no one will detect this stuff because it's goes right into the unconscious the conscious mind doesn't remember it so how do people get a hold of you where do they go um, well it's very very easy to do so there's there's a couple ways to do it first of all if you would like to get a copy of my book an e-copy of my book plus some training videos i have three training videos one is on using subtle words to sell there's five subtle words you can use to sell almost anyone anything anytime and there's one on the power of destroying objections, et cetera, et cetera. So it's about three videos and a downloadable e-copy of my book. Here's what you do. Text the word subtle, S-U-B-T-L-E. Text the word subtle, S-U-B-T-L-E, to the number 76626. That'll work in Canada and the United States. The other thing to do is go to my website, speakerpaulross.com speakerpaulross.com and you'll see a form you can use to get in touch with me and hop on the phone for a consult. Awesome. But I've really, <laughs> and I, I hope to get it. Let's schedule a call to talk offline and, and, yeah. uh, and see how we can maybe uh, help each other. I've really loved, uh, loved this interview. It's it, your talk. It, I, you know, I, I try to just keep it fun and, and I keep it rolling and, and, uh, you know, I, I don't use a lot of intros and bios and all this no, other could, stuff because it's just, it's just fluff to me. Um, and, and it's, and the readers just want to jump in and, and get to the meat and potatoes. So for all the audience, I want to thank you. And, uh, you know, please, you know, check out Paul and, and, and text subtle to, uh, what? Seven, six, six, two, six. Yeah. Seven, six, six, two, six. There you go. And I'll catch you on the next interview.